Good morning and good afternoon to those of us, to those of you joining us from West Africa. My name is Harriet Spears. I am the Strategic Partnerships Manager at Women's Global Education Project. Today's conversation is being recorded to share with supporters who could not make the live event. For those of you who are new to Women's Global, our mission is to empower women and girls in rural regions of Africa through education to build better lives and foster more equitable communities. We partner with grassroots activists and local leaders in rural Senegal and rural Kenya to dismantle the structural barriers that keep girls from attending and succeeding in school. Given the focus of our work, we are absolutely thrilled to be celebrating the book launch of David Monina Senge's first book, Radical Inclusion, Seven Steps to Help You Create a More Just, More Just Workplace, Home, and World, which was just released yesterday. Radical Inclusion is the first book to be published by Moment of Lift Books, Melinda French Gates Publishing Imprint in partnership with Flatiron Books. To share more about David's background, he is the Minister of Basic and Senior Secondary Education and Chief Innovation Officer for the government of Sierra Leone. He holds a, bas a bachelor's and a PhD in biomedical engineering from Harvard College and MIT, respectively. He is a TED Fellow, WEF Young Global Leader, Obama Foundation Leaders Africa Fellow, and was included on the 2013 Forbes 30 Under 30 list. David also serves as the chairman of the Global Education Monitoring Report to UNESCO. Radical Inclusion is his first book. We have partnered with a women-owned bookstore in Chicago, Women and Children First, to offer a 10% discount code on Radical Inclusion if you order by tomorrow, May 4th using code women's global 23. I dropped the link in the chat, so make sure that you order your copy before tomorrow. Attendees who order from Women and Children First will also receive a complimentary gift from Moment of Lift Books. T today's event will begin with a moderated discussion and afterwards we'll have an open Q&A session where you can ask questions in the chat to David and Sonia. If questions come up at any point during the moderated discussion, please feel free to navigate towards the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to add your question in the chat, and we will answer as many as we can throughout the session. So with that, it is my great honor to introduce our moderator for today's conversation, longtime women's global advocate, Sonia Anderson. Sonia is the founding executive director of Together Rising, a philanthropic organization started by author and activist Glennon Doyle, her sister Amanda Doyle, and her wife, Olymp Olympic gold medalist Abby Wambach, that provides funds and other essential resources to support some of the most urgent needs in our country and around the world. Sonia began her career as a high school teacher as part of the Mississippi Teacher Corps and went on to the Ford Foundation, the Oprah Winfrey Foundations, and most recently served as the president of Thrive Chicago, amassing decades of experience in education grant making and policy reform. In addition to her role at Together Rising, Sonia is the founder of Embark Strategies. Sonia holds an undergraduate degree in economics and political science from Yale University, a master's degree in international affairs from the University of Ghana, and a doctorate in education planning and policy from Harvard College. So with that, thank you so much for joining us today. I know a lot of bios, but now the fun part will really start with Sonia and David. So I'm going to pass it over to them both. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harriet. Uh, it's funny, when you talk about decades of experience, I suddenly felt very old, uh, but that's okay. That's okay. Um, David, it is so great to meet you. Thank you so much for taking the time to uh, to join in in this conversation today. I'm really excited about our conversation. Um, and uh, as I said, I, I promise to take it easy on you uh, with just some questions about 
your life and your background and all of the remarkable work that you've done to date. So I'm going to begin at the beginning and would love for, for you to start with just telling us a little bit about your story, about your background, about your childhood, where you're from, and you know, sort of what brought you to um, this particular moment of serving in the, in the ministry um, and writing the book. But just like a little bit of a snapshot of your, um, your background, sort of who you are and, and what you do. Uh, it's a 36 years of a very short snapshot. Um, I think, thank you. It's such a wonderful pleasure to be talking with you, Sonia, and, um, and, and to really have everybody who's participating in this book um, launch conversation virtually. It's important work that Women's Global is doing. For me, I will think about my childhood as one that was um, uh, based and, and centered on play and exploration. I was lucky. I, I grew up in Bo, Sierra Leone, and I had parents and family who, in many ways, allowed me to, to run around and play. Um, I took advantage of it by returning home slightly later than I was expected to, but um, they gave me that space and comfort. Um, I ultimately went to school in Freetown, the capital for secondary school, and went to Norway and um, continued on at Harvard and MIT where I worked on prosthetic research. And I was influenced to work on prosthetic research because I had seen um, some amputees during the war in Sierra Leone, particularly the children. And the idea was how do you make them be comfortable and not have them be beggars in the street because they were not using their prosthesis. Um, I went into private sector at IBM Research in Nairobi and South Africa, uh, Joburg, uh, after MIT. And I got invited by President Bio to join his government as the country's first chief innovation officer, where I set up the Directorate of Science, Technology, and Innovation. Did that for a year and a half. And um, President Bio surprised me and invited me to be a Minister of Education whilst holding the portfolio of innovation at the same time. And, um, and I've been doing that now for the last three and a half years. Thank you, David. I want to stay here for just a second, actually, and talk about these dual roles that you have, both the focus on innovation and the focus on education. How, are those two things in your mind and in the context of your work separate and distinct? Are there moments where there is a tremendous synergy between them? Can you say a little bit about that? Well, it's a it's a very Im important question. For me, they are the same thing. Um, but so when I became minister, actually, before I even became uh, chief innovation officer, uh, a lot of people said, oh, no, why would he do it? He's going to fail. He doesn't know what he's doing. And then innovation is not important. You know, we're talking about basics here and you're telling us about innovation. This is not necessary. And then I became minister and it's like, oh, no, but why will he do this? First of all, he's going to fail as a minister. He's too young, never worked with teachers. Um, I was told this to my face, by the way, in parliament, in the world of parliament, and with people directly telling me in my, to my face that um, I will fail. Um, and then it became, but of course, he's going to fail now because he's doing two things. He's innovation and um, education. This is horrible. Um, but I'm grateful that my approach to all of this has been how do we use the opportunities that we have to expand um, opportunities for others as well. So one perfect example of how these two are connected. Um, I traveled all across Sierra Leone, trying listening to people and engaging with people on education. And people always complained everywhere you went that they could not get their results. When their children take their exams, 400,000 or so of them, it often takes up to 10 weeks for them to get the results or they have to pay up to $10 for them to. And even when they pay, they have to travel miles before they are able to go online to use um, some scratch card to get their, their children's results. So most poor families, most rural families cannot make decisions about their children's future um, in time. So as CIO at the Directorate of Innovation, we built this SMS USSD system because we go with mobile first hybrid technologies that we applied in education 
that means that any child anywhere in the country who takes an exam can know their results by just typing in their examination number and they get an SMS back. Everywhere the president goes today in Sierra Leone, somebody goes, thank you so much, Your Excellency, for your innovation that you brought in, 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 in education. Um, and that was a perfect example. And another one is um, we take dictionaries for granted. We take spell check for granted. Many of us can write without spell check. The dictionaries are embedded in what we do. Uh, but most people don't have dictionaries, physical or digital. So we built um, SMS dictionaries that people have access to nationwide, every student, um, and a whole bunch of other solutions that we've built that incorporates hybrid technology from paper to SMS to USSD to mobile apps to online platforms. So they're the same thing for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting, right? Because I think you know, we tout innovation in so many sectors, right? Innovation is typically seen as a good thing. It's a measure of progress on the whole. I think it's how we often think about it. But in education, we often stagnant in our approach to ed education, right? To curriculum, to pedagogy, et cetera. And so the fact that you were able to uh, bring these two things together hand in hand makes perfect sense to me and, uh, and is much needed throughout the sector. Um, so speaking of innovation, Right. One of the major uh, sort of ideological innovations that you write about in the book is around the pregnancy ban. And so I'm curious, you know, oftentimes in our personal or professional lives, we find ourselves at a crossroads, right, at a moral crossroads where we have to ask ourselves whether we should go or should we stay? Should we speak out? Should we remain silent? And depending on the circumstances, one answer might be more appropriate than the other. Uh, what prompted you, David, when you were at that crossroads uh, to make the choice that you did? And then what were some of the things that you had to take into consideration? I think the, the first thing I need to underline is that whenever we do make that decision to speak up um, and act up, uh, it's important. We have to get to that point. Because when we work on solving these social injustices that bring other people on board, it is beneficial for all of us. Working in inclusion is not, uh, it's not about others. We have to think about this as it's important because irrespective of who you are, you will be excluded at some point in time if you're not already, um, whether permanently or temporarily. And when we build these inclusive systems, it works for us. So it's always the final answer ultimately is maybe the timing might not be right at some point, but we always have to take action, speak up and act up to, 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 to fight for inclusion. And we can go in a little bit more about that later. But for me, um, it really was a crazy 24 hours, okay, um, in, in 2019. November 19th, I went to the well of parliament, the inside the parliament. And before that, I had gone to a committee room where parliamentarians told me, you're going to fail. You don't know what you're doing. Um, we don't trust that you have the experience uh, to be a minister. And I said, well, it pleases excellency to appoint me. So, and I believe that I can do this. Thank you, but I don't agree with you. And I got the approval in Parliament. The twentieth in the morning, I signed my oath of office, oath, oath of uh, office as minister to the president. We snap. We take photos. So I go from being stressed on the nineteenth to being super happy on the twentieth in the morning and super excited. And then um, I went to my office to meet my staff. And I meet them, maybe I'm a little bit uneasy, they're older, they, some of them work with my mom, some of them, you know, um, they, I don't know what they're thinking. And then I go on to a program uh, at, the, at, one, at the convention center, it's World Children's Day, November 20th. And the president, so I sit in the auditorium and the president is giving a speech. Um, he starts off really well. And at some point in his speech, he looks up and says, uh, a lot of people say pregnant girls should go to school. I say, no, I said pregnant girls should not go to school. I think they should stay home. After they give birth, they can come. And it's important that we keep this policy. And as the room is applauding, I'm sitting there thinking what just happened. 
I just came from a dream job. This is something I'd always wanted uh, to participate and shape policy at national level, at cabinet level. And now this, my mentor, my friend, my ally, somebody who I trust, who I believe in, is telling me that I have to be the one who's uh, implementing these exclusion policies of getting pregnant girls. So I, I'm sad and depressed and feel like I should just quit. Mm-hmm. And to your point, at that point, I could have quit. I could have said, no, I, I can't do this. Uh, there's no harm. The people one day ago said I was going to fail anyway. So it's okay. I should might as well just mm-hmm. say, you know, I'm not going to do this um, now. Mm-hmm. But I drove back with him. And the reason um, was I wanted to engage and understand what he was thinking. Because I know him. I know that deep down he's somebody who believed in um, inclusion. He's somebody who wanted to make sure education was available for everybody. That was what most of his speech was. Mm -hmm. And um, I asked him a question to say, are you sure? Do you believe what you just said? Do you? And the other people around the table said, yeah, the president said, great, the president. And I ignored them and I turned to the president again. Like, do you, what do you, do you believe what you just said? And he said, um, you know, I've never met a pregnant girl who wants to go to school. So if you go and talk to them and uh, you tell me otherwise, I'll be willing to listen. So that gave me hope. It was that hope that I used to keep fighting for this. So it wasn't just the president, though. I mean, other friends, family, colleagues also supported the ban. How did that how did that make you feel? Were you surprised by that? Like, what did you do with that realization once once you understood the position that others held as well? It is really important that when we disagree with people or when we think people hold different views, we don't think about them as bad people inherently. Mm-hmm. We don't put them in a bin that says horrible, cannot engage. Um, as you rightly said, uh, the president uh, publicly spoke about maintaining the ban. I went to my home, my children, my daughter, my sister, my mother agreed with the president. My staff in the ministry uh, agreed with the president and and everywhere on, on, on radio and teachers. Um, and it That minute, for me, perhaps the most important thing, apart from being sad, was understanding that just because these people who I loved, who I'm disappointed that they believe differently, um, hold a different position, a different view, have a set of fears that I don't have, that I can't relate to, but I needed to understand was really transformational for me. Um, and so I, I, I was sad, but um, it, it, was a, it was an important moment for me to hold space that they believe differently informed by different fairs. Yeah, you're setting this up very nicely for me for my next question, David. I have your book right here uh, in my hand. And you uh, talk about, of course, throughout the book, the, the heart and soul of the book is these seven principles of radical inclusion, right? And you name them, uh, identify the exclusion, listen to understand and learn, define your role, why you, why now, build a coalition, advocacy and action, adapting to a new normal, and beyond inclusion, right? I am curious of those seven, and obviously you so eloquently wrote uh, in detail about each one of these seven principles, but of these seven, which one or ones proved to be the biggest hurdle for you uh, as you move forward with this work, both in terms of your own personal personality, your temperament, right? Like you had to really sort of struggle to arrive at that place, but also in terms of engaging other people around this issue. Oof, it's like which of my children do I love the most? Uh, I think um, the element of listening to understand was very difficult for me. I think often as people, we all have different views and we maintain certain things. We have certain boundaries. We um, And we expect that other people should 
naturally believe those things that we believe in and that's how we form groups anyways in in, in similar interests similar beliefs um it is very difficult to listen to people tell you about things that you don't believe in it is very difficult to hold space um and understand when to speak back so that you don't close the other person even as they express themselves and as they express their fears as they express why they believe what they believe in if we don't allow that space if we don't honor that space um, it becomes very difficult to break any ground um, however it is important to note that even as we do that there's a boundary that we can't let cross where we allow more harm to be done yeah right so it's a fine balance of listening and engaging to understand without allowing more harm to be done by those people who you're trying to fight for that i think is the most difficult and it's difficult in part because often we try to change other people you know i'm trying to convince you for whatever reason um, and I think I, I write about this in the book, but the hardest part and the most important part is we forget that we have to change ourselves. We have to convince and transform ourselves. Um, and that is very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's stay here for just a second, because what you are alluding to, or at least at the beginning of your comments, is this notion uh, of empathy. Uh, and on page 126 of your book, you say empathy always improves our understanding but it does so particularly when the issues are complex. Empathy breaks barriers and quickly and barriers must be broken to form strong coalitions. It is the most powerful tool a leader can have. No matter how much I disagree with someone, no matter how wrong I think their comments are, whether in person or online, I always pause for a minute and I'll allow myself to imagine the emotions that underpin and drive their experience. So, can you say a little bit, can you tell us, uh, uh, share with us an example of when you when you had to put this in practice, right, and activate this sense of empathy and leverage it in order to build a coalition and to break down barriers? Because of how my leadership style is, um, I'm always engaging online. And I think I, I do speak about how this break in conversation is even worse online because there are some things that, and I and I believe this, some of those people who write the kinds of things to say online, they will never, even if they stood in front of me, they can never open their mouths to say it never. to me. Not because they're afraid, I'm not gonna punch them, but it's just, it's not possible. I don't, it's not possible for them to say Breaks those things. It's the rules of decorum that, to say certain yes, things. It's just, uh, and because I engage online and my loved ones are there and they see, it's very, it's, um, it's one of those where I have to, um, it's a different set of skill and I, I'm not a master at it to have empathy for people behind the keyboard that have an empathy with somebody who you see, by the way. So these are completely different uh, right. skills. But I'll reference one, just last week I was in parliament. Um, we passed one of the most progressive laws um, on basic education in Sierra Leone that now, by the way, makes it legal for pregnant girls to go to school and to stay in school and just expands. So all of this work, when I wrote the book, this wasn't there. Uh, it wasn't the law, it was just a policy. And now it's law, uh, mm -hmm. which is which is really, really fascinating. Yeah. But during that debate, um, I'm feeling really great about this law. It's progressive and everybody's saying really nice things. And some people said, you know, Mr. Minister, uh, corporal punishment. Uh, I think this law, this law is wonderful, but we have to keep corporal punishment in our schools because our kids need to be disciplined. And, you know, this is Africa, this is Sierra Leone. Um, and I start speaking, I say the evidence shows that uh, violence to children affects their learning. In fact, we've been piloting this already. There's a policy already banning. Give all these examples. Mm -hmm. And somebody else comes up again. Yes, but you know, this is not going to be great. This is this. I respond again, you know, 
the Truth and Reconciliation Commission said, um, the war, it was violent and we should ban. All this logic I'm saying, it's not going anywhere. <laughs> so I'm trying to speak about logic, data, evidence. Mm -hmm. It's not landing. Mm -hmm. And um, I had to pause understand why those parliamentarians were asking what they were asking for um and speak to the affairs again they were afraid about even if i don't even if the affairs are not based on evidence mm -hmm. um but until you understood what it was that they were afraid of yeah. um and speak to those fears which is part of empathy right um it wouldn't have happened. Anyway, uh, ultimately they kept the corporal, the ban on corporal punishments in the law and I was very wow. happy. And now wow. it's one of the most, uh, it, it, it was super exciting. Yeah. I would have felt like it was a, I would not have been very happy if that came out, but the parliamentarians, we all came on one page and um, we, 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 we bonded on us being able to vent and express our affairs. And we came up with a law that I think they themselves would defend wherever they are. Amazing, that's amazing. It's, it's so interesting. You're making me think about, you know, this, this nexus of policy, but also culture, right? And culture and tradition um, can be powerful influencers in how we think about uh, the world around us, how we normalize certain practices and behaviors without even really sort of interrogating them or examining them closely. And what you have done and, and your colleagues in parliament is really just shine a bright light on these things that these corporal punishment. Um, I'm from uh, Mississippi, the deep South of this country and corporal punishment is alive and well in many parts of the state, um, despite the evidence, right? But to your point, it, it's just an inherent part of the culture. And so trying to change mindsets, is not just about the written policy, right? It's about changing hearts as well as changing heads. And I think that's exactly what you're touching on. Uh, with we should have all the people in Mississippi read the book. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah. all the 17 or so states that still have corporal punishments in yep. America. Yep. It's, it's, I find it, you know, we think about America as very progressive and mm -hmm. um, in terms of democracy and human rights. But um, during this process, doing the research to see that corporal punishment is legal in- that's right those states i was shocked i'll tell you and um yeah. but to the point that the question that you just asked empathy and listening mm -hmm. and understanding mm -hmm. i think is what we need um mm -hmm. really have this discussion yeah. that can lead to progressive outcomes yeah absolutely um, I want to turn to another one of the steps so step number five this is advocacy and action and you say Taking action is the most direct way to enable inclusion. In fact, that's the only way. Silent advocacy is not an option. I love that line. So I was really struck by your push against this idea of silent advocacy, particularly in a world and in a social moment where there can be great cost to speaking out, right? So silent advocacy can feel like, like a form of engagement because it's not safe to speak out until we post things or we repost things or you know whatever that version is or we talk about it in very private circles, but we are not vocal and public with it. And so I'm curious if you could say a little bit more about this push to be vocal and explicit in our advocacy around whatever the issue may be when we know that at some times it comes at tremendous cost. I think, The change is hard, change is not easy. There is a cost for fighting for change, but change cannot come without advocacy and action. Yeah. And change cannot be maintained without sustained advocacy and action. It's so hard that on my, in my office, there is a post-it that I stare at every day that say something about, um, the, the path of least resistance is not an option. That mm -hmm. change must come through doing the hard work. I stare at this mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's important that we remind ourselves that, yes, there are times when we may not have to speak up. Timing matters, obviously, mm -hmm. um, in all of this. 
but ultimately no matter what the coalition is that you've built no matter what the research is that you've done you have to engage and get into the line of um of duty you have yeah. to go and it comes at, at the cost to many people and and it's it's not trivial people lose yeah. their lives they lose their livelihoods and um it's not a cost that everybody is ready for and that's why we cannot do it alone often that's why it's better when we're able to build a movement that that does this advocacy finding champions finding the right allies finding the right coalitions because if you're not there either then that change stops that change is not going to happen um the it's important for us to know that it's a, it's a very interesting thing about judgment as well and how we judge people and um about readiness and about the context because all of our context matter but here's an example of um of change uh, that i i learned about in the 70s the curb cut mod effect where you have these curbs and people with disabilities were having hard times they couldn't use sidewalks um and a bunch of act students went and poured concrete to make ramps uh, and physically cut these curbs and today everybody uses it mm -hmm. runners walkers travelers it is an essential part of mm -hmm. the of the of the highway of our streets is that there are curb cuts and we all use it and benefit from it it would not have happened if people were just silent and if yeah. everybody just sat there some people had to go mix concrete pour concrete on the road um, in spite of the challenges that they could have been arrested yeah. and that's what led to the transformation that we have today so for these inclusion these um or these these issues that we're speaking about we have to take action it's not going to solve itself and the reason for that the reason why it doesn't solve itself is because the status quo is easy to maintain well that's right for those included and for those excluded it's just why am i going to worry about it it's okay life is fine i figure the way to live with it yeah that leads me to a, a, a wondering here. So all over the world, David, all over the world, um, men um, sit in positions of power and make decisions about women and women's bodies, right? I'm curious what you think uh, the role of men should be in these kinds of shifts away from the status quo in the way that you were just talking about, right? In ways that invite inclusion, uh, in ways that promote equity. I mean, you obviously uh, are a man and you were at the forefront of championing, championing this policy change in Sierra Leone, but like what, what, how do we, should we, A, and then how do we engage more men to be vocal, to not be silent advocates, to take, you know, run the risk of paying the cost uh, of being outspoken around these matters of inequity wherever they exist. I think it's about patriarchy and the system that involves uh, in it. And it's patriarchy largely involves men, but it's a framework of thinking that can involve um, other genders and women as well. And, and for me, by the way, in terms of this conversation, some of the things that I found hardest to understand when I started it earlier was when I thought, because I, I just assumed every woman will say, oh, this is a good thing, we should change it. Mm. But when I thought that there are women who will, who will say, um, no, 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 we need to keep this uh, in mm -hmm. place. And then I understood that it was about the patriarchal system that yeah. has changed, that affects all of our minds, largely driven by men, but, but everybody else. So I, I will say it's about changing the patriarchy. Uh, in terms of men and how, the president is a good ally for me. The president is a good friend, good mentor, and this would not have happened without President Bio's vision and, and determination. Something we bonded over a lot was about our daughters. We both have daughters who are about the same age. And somehow we, um, we our frame of thinking in a lot of these conversations, actually, now that I reflect on it, is about what is the world that we need to work on such that our daughters at age 18 could be having the same opportunities to fulfill their own specific potentials as anybody else, uh, any boy, any... And I think when you frame, when you begin to understand that girls, whoever they are, mm -hmm. daughters of presidents, daughters of ministers, any girl, daughter of a market woman, that there are systematic challenges 
systemic challenges that they have just by being the agenda, particularly in many parts of the world. Um, until you sit and understand that, you might think, oh, it's just BS. These guys are just talking about gender, gender, gender. Um, you, which brings us back to actually to uh, the, the first point, which is you have to define the exclusion. You have to read upon it. You have to understand the parameters. You have to know that there are specific things related to gender and girls and women that need to be changed that does not give them the same equity. Um, and for us, it is, again, empathy. It is uh, having and thinking with women but for women in the future and saying what are the things that need to change such that and interestingly um when my sister for example um when i spoke to my sister and i said oh you know what, what do you think um should this happen and and i love my sister we have a great relationship she's like no my pregnant girl should not go to school you know they'll influence other girls and her daughter, Khadija, who lives with me, who I, uh, who's my daughter, um, I treat like my daughter. Um, and Khadija believed this. And my sister was thinking, well, Khadija. And I said, look, listen, if Khadija becomes pregnant, um, would you want Khadija to come out of school? And it was like, well, Khadija won't get pregnant anyway. It's like, yeah, I understand, I understand. <laughs> but if Khadija does, yeah. well, I guess she could go to school. I mean, I don't see how. I, and I think it becomes, so she was not thinking about this from a, um, from a system point of view. Yeah. Um, and I think once she began to get the empathy, she began to um, see other people's feelings and uh, then it changed her, her position yeah. on it. And, and for Khadija, it was uh, me asking her, look, Khadija, um, if your friend gets pregnant, will you go and be pregnant? Oh, of course, no, that I right. wouldn't do it. It's like, but that was your fear. Your fear is, and then it's like, oh, I'm talking about other, other for the, it's for the other students, for the other right. children. It's like, it's okay. The other students will, they will answer the questions for themselves. Right. But if you won't, why should you assume that your other friends will as well? Yeah. Yeah, that's brilliant. Uh, David, you shared two uh, really important updates in the context of this conversation. Number one, uh, confirming that the, the, uh, the uh, unban uh, around pregnant girls has been, or the ban around pregnant girls has been lifted, um, and that has now been made into law. Um, and the ban on corporal punishment has also now been made into law. Is that correct? So that correct. is that's wonderful and amazing. Um, what next? Because there's yeah. the law, and then there's the implementation, right? There's the word, and then there's the deed. So um, this will be my last question, and then I will actually turn it over to Q and A from the audience. But what what next? I think you 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 answered it, which is that there's the law and there's the implementation. We need the law. We need so radical inclusion says that we have to change the legal infrastructure, we have to change the physical infrastructure, we have to correct the historical injustice, we have to do all of these things, right? Um, and so we're working on it. But I'll tell you, so this law was passed about a week and two days ago. No, um, last week, Monday, mm -hmm. I think, um, was when this law was passed, which is amazing. Um, and on Wednesday, I went to um, to, uh, to Bo in the South, and I had this engagement with about 2,000 university students, Q&A, about their role in driving radical inclusion and, and education. Then I went to visit um, a group of students who had physical disabilities. I'd never gone to their place, about 50 of them. And um, they had all ranging physical mm -hmm. disabilities. And I had brought some gifts to them and I wanted to engage them, learning materials. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the conversation, I'm looking at the names of the schools. Mm -hmm. um, and... The first one is Paul's School for the Blind. I tell them what I had to tell them. The other one was the Milton Magai, Sheshe Home. Tell them what I had to tell them. And the third one was called 
school for the mentally retarded. Mm. I couldn't get myself to say it. I was mm-hmm. shocked. I was, I, I had just passed this transformational law two days ago. Mm-hmm. And here there existed a school for the mentally retarded. Um, I stopped talking, sent a text message to my team and said, please look through all 12,300 schools that we have. Any school that has a name like this, Mm -hmm. any school that has a name, deaf and dumb, I need it changed immediately. Mm -hmm. Um, So uh, I think the point that I'm trying to make is with radical inclusion, with these laws, with these policies, the work never ends and it never stops. And that's where the book ends, which is beyond inclusion. We have to keep expanding the inclusion circle. Otherwise, it will shrink super fast. And so whenever we see an injustice, again, to the point about taking action, we can't be silent about it. We have to take action. I, we have to there and there say, no, this is unacceptable. We change it from today. Anyway, I left that meeting and I went to another meeting where I engaged about 350 students from several schools uh, in, 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 um, about the, the new law laws and I spoke about corporal punishment and one of the students comes up and goes well you know what's the impact of this anyway I think that we need corporal punishment in schools mm-hmm. um and so I had to explain to this student why we need him to go back to his colleagues and champion why we don't need corporal punishment right. That's right. But I think it's uh, engagement, it's solving. There are many, many other challenges, uh, many barriers of uh, an exclusion. And as I say in the book, the, the I think in the last paragraph in the book, um, to be really good at radical inclusion, uh, you have to keep going, you have to keep learning. There's no end. Well, thank you. On that note, uh, we will look forward to your sequel. Uh, because you will keep going uh, and continue to champion incredible change uh, for uh, Sierra Leone. Uh, I am going to turn to the Q&A for just a moment. Um, And David, I'll just read out a couple of questions um, for you, if that's okay. Uh, The first one says, first of all, uh, this was from uh, Danielle Greco. First of all, thank you for your work. It is very inspiring. Working in the field of education requires great motivation and vision skills because it is difficult to measure the impact of actions in the short term, which we all know is true. How important is it to have a long-term plan to take action for a better future? Two parts to this answer. I don't want us to agree that we all know it's true that it's difficult to measure mm-hmm. short-term impact because that's the problem with our education sector. Mm-hmm. We have to be able to see these specific things. These So we have a big vision, but there are small, small things that we are doing. So it's progress that we pass the law. It's progress that we have gender parity in Sierra Leone over three years due to systematic policies. It's progress that we now remove gender um, corporal punishment and have teachers being trained and in many schools that there are no more corporal punishment. We need to see these as major wins. They are not small. They are transformational wins. So in education, we have to keep measuring the data, learning outcomes, behavior, all of those things, and not waiting every five years to do some major study to see the impact. We have to measure them slowly. So that's my my, my, my response to that. But I do think the most important thing that we did in Sierra Leone is that these policies were not based on an election. We have an election in two months, uh, less than two months, um, and yet we are passing these laws Every other political election. person, presidential, parliamentary, all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and people who are political scientists will say, oh, my God, you should not be doing these kinds of things mm-hmm. when you're going for re-election. But for us in President Bill, these are not policies for the next election. They are generational changes. And so we have to be able to have politicians and leaders who can do and make these decisions for generations um, and also, you know, stay in power to make sure that they can implement them. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, The next question, Nancy Edwards, uh, she says, Minister Senge, congrats on your book. It sounds like a must read for many university courses across the globe. Are there specific university programs where you'd like to see the book added to required reading? And then she says, so excited to see the progress you've made. She had the pleasure of working with your dad in Bo. 
So uh, that's my dad um, uh, worked in uh, education for a long time, mm. um, and health. But I think I don't have specific schools. I think I wrote the book uh, for myself. I do use the principles in the book all the time for what I want to do. Um, and I hope that there are other people who can relate to the book. It's not an education policy book. It speaks about education. It's a book that talks about, it really is a leadership book about how we can build coalitions, whether you're in civil society or having whatever the causes that you're fighting for. Um, I think you'll, you'll see that it's beneficial. Um, if you're in private sector and you want to think about how to have transformational change in your in your entity, you can use lots of the lessons here. Um, it's a it's an everyday book. It's an everyday guidebook. I have used those principles myself repeatedly, even after um, getting the the radical inclusion policy done, because we've yeah. done several other policies since leading up through to the law. Um, Thank, thank you for thinking that universities can benefit from it. I, I hope that people do. I hope that people read it because um, I think we all have to keep working for more inclusion. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and then the last question from Bernard Wesley. Uh, do you have a plan to get these laws to the educator? innovation since you do hold these uh, these two titles. And I will just ask a corollary to that question, Bernard, if you don't mind. Um, I'm struck by the fact that elections are happening any moment now, right? And so how, so Bernard's question, connecting the policy to the actual people on the ground, the educators who will be, you know, implementing these policies in real life, but also the potential implications given that there is an election coming. There may potentially be a change in national leadership. And we know that sometimes with changes in leadership come changes in policy, even for those things that we thought had been asked and answered and settled. So I'm, I'm adding to Bernard's question and would just love to hear how you're, you're thinking about both of those things. Um, thank you. With Bernard's point, actually, we are so, I love my team and I love the partners that we have. We are we are we're pushing the limits in in, uh, in in bringing these innovations to the classrooms. Now, about a thousand teachers currently have um, an app that we built with um, EdTech Hub and Fab Inc. Fab Inc. Uh, some of our partners from the UK, where they have a teacher coach, uh, a Chat GPT teacher coach, on their WhatsApp. And mm -hmm. so you can send a message about anything and it incorporates chat GPT's uh, core library, but also our policies. Uh, we are training it, especially with our policies as well. So on radical inclusion, uh, if you ask questions about radical inclusion, it will tell you how you can implement it. And we're trying to make this normal. Um, so we are incorporating this um, through innovation. That's a, an example of that. Um, an example, I'll tell you. When I started to speak about radical inclusion in the ministry, maybe one or two people believed it. Everybody else said, you know, don't bring this to us. Yeah. Um, but when COVID happened yeah. um, and we closed schools and we're very careful about how and all of that, we reopened schools and we're having a conversation about radical inclusion. Kids who were poor, who had moved to their parents, we wanted to bring them back to where your school was, such that money um, was not an issue. Um, and my partner in secretary, civil servant at the time, who did not start on with me on this radical inclusion mm -hmm. part. Mm -hmm. um, during the debates, there was a child in one district, one child who needed to move. We provided school buses for all the other districts. And somebody said, you know, it's just one child. We can, we don't have to send a vehicle for that child. And my partner and secretary said, based on radical inclusion, we have to make sure that that child gets a bus. Mm -hmm. And I sat there thinking, I guess my work is done on this. Um, but within my ministry today, there is nobody, there's nobody who does not understand and fight for radical inclusion. Yeah. I don't have to say anything. They see the value, they get it. And it's not just my ministry eh? in cabinet. Everybody speaks about radical inclusion, the president, every chief, everybody anywhere um, speaks about. It really is the word of the year, of the 
five years in Sierra Leone. You can ask anybody and they'll tell you what radical inclusion is. And that is because we're not thinking about it. We will win the election in two months. Our president has done a lot of fantastic work and we're, we're very confident about the things that we've done. But it is that these policies were done because we believe that it will lead to national transformation. Yeah. And there's never been a time when I have gotten an instruction from the president to say, oh, only do something because of the election. It always has been, how do we transform this country? And that's why I'm excited about my work and I love it and why I wrote the book. Yeah. Minister Senge, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for all of your hard work. Uh, thank you so much for being a progressive leader for your country and giving us all so much to think about um, this morning or afternoon, wherever folks are calling from. Uh, we deeply appreciate you and everything that you uh, stand for. Uh, and we will, we will be watching the Sierra Leone elections uh, with great excitement. Um, and we'll look forward to all the great things that we know are to come through your leadership. Harriet, thank you turning very it back much. over to you. Thank you both so much, Sonia and David. It was an inspirational hour to, to hear from both of you. Um, to close out this conversation, I know there were at least a few questions that we were not able to answer live. For people who are based in the US, I know David has a few more book launch events. You're in New York on Friday and Seattle next Monday. Is that correct? Fantastic. Um, so. Anyone feel free to, to join those events in person. We'll be sharing this recording after the event. Um, but while I have everyone here, just to connect this all back to the greater work that so many organizations um, and, and champions like David are doing, I, I wanted to connect your incredible um, book with Women's Global Education Project. So you are based in Sierra Leone. Our work is based in Senegal and Kenya, but across context, we see that some of the same barriers are existing um, no matter where you are in, in remote rural context. So it in radical inclusion, it was particularly focused on early marriage and early pregnancy, but some of these additional barriers and, and reasons for inclusion that you spoke about could be poverty, undervaluing of girls' potential for health education or resources for menstrual health. And then again, the, the culture piece that Sonia mentioned, if there are regions where um, practices like FGM still exist. So the work that we do, we see as being so connected with the work of governments and community leaders in that we are partnering directly with grassroots activists and community leaders to create community-led, girl-centered and driven change to keep this, these policies um, moving forward towards a more inclusive environment. So we just are, are so grateful to partner with champions and, and government leaders um, like yourself. Um, and I'm so happy to share that through this work, we will serve over 10,000 women and children this year with over 99% of the girls in our scholarship program staying in school each year. So we feel that through cultivating networks of support, multi-sectoral ne networks of both governments and grassroots leaders, we can create this, this transformational lasting change. So it allows grandmothers um, reading the book. It I was immediately reminded of Magdalene, a, a grandmother who I met in Kenya this past November, who was able by being a part of a adult literacy class um, where she was learning to read and write and manage her household finances. She realized that the way she could most help her community and her family was by taking care of her daughter's son or grandson so that her daughter could go back to school and complete secondary school. So it is women like Magdalene working with policies like this to create change and, and create a lasting environment where women and girls can succeed in school and beyond. So we, again, are, are just so grateful to, to have you here with us. Thank you to everyone who joined us here today. If you have not already, I believe we had at least a few more gifts left from Moment of Lift Books. If you purchase directly from Women and Children First using this QR code, 
using code women's global 23. Up until tomorrow, you will get 10% off on the book. And um, secondly, we, we hope you choose to stay connected with us. We will be sending out the recording from this event afterwards. Um, and we are just so grateful for everyone for being here. So thank you again, Sonia and David. Have a wonderful rest of the day and rest of the week and continue practicing radical inclusion wherever you go. So thank you both so much.